So at this, uh, we're going to do a short presentation to present the preliminary results of a study called Does Current Practice Align with Best Practice for Intensive Hand Function Training in Children with Hemiplegia? So this is a project that's now underway across Canada, which I believe many of you have participated in, as well as uh, some of the people on the webinar um, as well. Um, I just would like to acknowledge the Edith the Richard Strauss Foundation in Canada that has funded this um, project, and we're very fortunate to have this funding at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy at McGill that supports uh, a number of projects that relate to knowledge translation, research, and rehabilitation. So this is our research team. Uh, the co-principal investigator is Keiko Shikako-Thomas, who is an occupational therapist who's completed her PhD and is now doing postdoctoral training uh, in knowledge translation and policy development at McMaster University with Mary Law. Um, we're very fortunate to have Manon Germain, who's an occupational therapist here at uh, Marie Enfant and uh, works in the CP clinic and really is one of the champions of the constraint program here. And so it was very important to get a clinician's perspective um, the real-life perspective in this aspect of the project. Uh, we have Darcy Failings, who you've met, who is a clinician scientist, uh, a clinical expert and researcher in this field of uh, CP treatment, and Andrew Gordon, an international uh, researcher in the, in the uh, development and use of constraint therapies, uh, as well as by manual approaches of, of the intensive upper extremity treatment. And Doug Maynard, um, who um, has, is an associate director of the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers and has really been very helpful in helping us seek out all the different pediatric rehabilitation centers across Canada and, uh, so that we can um, be sure to recruit um, all the different centers across Canada that could potentially use this type of treatment. So as you know, um, in, when you look at children with cerebral palsy, the vast majority have a spastic form of CP, and indeed the most common form, if we look at the CP registries in Australia and in now in Canada, that roughly a third of children with CP have hemiplegia. Um, and when you uh, look at these children functionally, it's really their upper extremity much more than their lower extremity that has uh, important limitations in function. Um, we see that in the literature that some of the traditional approaches we've been using in the clinical setting have not shown uh, very strong evidence of uh, effectiveness. So it's very exciting to see the literature that's emerged in this particular area to see such strong evidence in support of a rehabilitation intervention. Uh, I think Andy has done a great job of reviewing this evidence um, and showing the efficacy as he said, over 80 studies now and about 30 uh, randomized clinical trials, well-designed trials. So if you look at the quality of the evidence, many of these studies are very high quality in, the, in their design and in their control uh, of different parameters and looking at a variety of aspects of the actual treatment and, and using a wide range of outcome measures. So there certainly is very good evidence to support this type of treatment uh, for use uh, for children with CP, and particularly for children with hemiplegia in terms of the evidence thus far. Um, as was mentioned, it's a task-oriented, more-to-learning approach where practice is the key element. Intensity, uh, if we look at the evidence, uh, it's, you know, most studies uh, emphasize 60 to 90 hours of treatment or more uh, in a short period of time. Um, it's very important that that it's not just about constraining, but it's about the type of uh, the type of activities that are provided. That they're meaningful activities. They're fun for the children. They're actively engaged, and you have to have very clever interventionists working with them to be sure that these children don't find very even more clever ways to uh, go to their usual ways of using their uh, non-affected or less affected side. So it's. Um, there's a package to this kind of uh, program, and it's not just a matter of constraining or providing a lot of activity, but the types of activities chosen are very important. Um, and the most of the evidence thus far has been for a group approach, but I think with time we'll see more evidence about more individualized and home-based types of approaches. 
So what's the gap? So we have a lot of good evidence to support um, a, a new treatment for children with CP, but um, anecdotal data would suggest that many centers are not offering this treatment and that there is limited access to this treatment for children. And uh, it's not surprising given the challenges of implementing a very intensive program that is not uh, packaged in a way that is traditional in terms of the way we offer treatment uh, currently in small doses over periods of time. Like, for example, the 45 minutes a week over many weeks is a very traditional and typical way that we offer treatment. So it requires a lot of creativity and uh, resource juggling to be able to offer this type of approach. Um, so it, the objectives of this research study was really to look at current practice in Canada. So we wanted to determine, we did an environmental scan, so this is in progress, um, trying to see the extent to which this new treatment is being taken up and used across the country in the various pediatric rehabilitation centers. So we wanted to look at the proportion of pediatric rehab centers that are using uh, this type of intensive upper extremity training uh, in some form or other. And um, we also were exploring the barriers and facilitators to developing and maintaining this type of program. So this is a study that uses mixed methods. So we are first quantitatively doing a telephone survey of all the different centers across Canada uh, with a standard questionnaire about whether or not they have a program, and if so, what the characteristics of this program is in terms of intensity, frequency, types of activities, age group, et cetera and um, whether they, what they feel are the barriers to the, using this program and things that made it happen. And if they didn't use it, again, what they feel the barriers um, are or the facilitators might be to developing such a program. And then we also did a qualitative study, which we've now completed um, with a variety of focus groups. And um, so we've had four focus groups across um, across Canada. Uh, we first had one in Ontario, in Edmonton actually was our first, which coincided with a NeuroDevNet meeting. Um, and then also Ontario Hall in Lourview, Quebec here in Marianfant, and also at Mackay as a separate center. And uh, we aim to have participants in these focus groups. There were about 10 to 15 participants per focus group. Um, and these were individuals from different disciplines those that were uh, participating and those that were not participating uh, whenever possible. We also brought people in from other centers, people in private practice, for example, in Ontario and, and Alberta that were using it um, or were wanting to use it. So we tried to have a good mix of different participants with uh, different perspectives to share. And uh, Keiko also had the opportunity to do a focus group in the Netherlands where they have a very active um, and successful program to get their uh, input as well. So um, we're, we now have completed the qualitative aspect of the focus groups and we're just now analyzing that data. And we've done 22 uh, telephone questionnaires from different centers and, and that's ongoing. So Keiko will present the results thus far. So um, in, uh, in our telephone surveys, as Annette described it, uh, so that gives you just an overview of uh, all the, the provinces that have participated in the survey. And uh, we have different centers and we still have uh, some more to, to go. But uh, that's interesting that it really uh, covered uh, uh, centers across Canada. Um, the, for the study, so most of the respondents were from rehab centers uh, like Manhelfa and others, uh, but there were some acute care hospitals with outpatient services and other uh, types of services. Most were in urban areas as opposed to rural um, areas. 100% uh, of the programs so far that were interviewed were public funded and um, had a, there were huge centers like with uh, an average of 305, uh, 365 uh, patients in total. And that's on average, we had a center, smaller centers as well. Uh, and 13 out of 17, sorry, this is outdated, but uh, I think it's 15 out of uh, the, 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 the 21 that had this question responded, actually had some sort of rehabilitation research uh, ongoing on their site. 
the the people responded the, the person who responded actually to the questionnaire uh, in the majority there were OTs uh, so 54 uh, percent but you also had PTs and some program managers with a non specific uh, clinical background uh, with uh, more, uh, the majority had more than 10 years of experience and uh, majority on the 30 to 39 years of uh, of age and uh, most uh, the degree of their specialty training was at BSc level and some are masters and some are PhD, the green is PhD. So um, about the programs that the centers had, so if you want to have this uh, quick picture of uh, what the programs are being offered in, in Canada, so most, as uh, we've uh, discussed here, uh, most are done as in a camp format, so either summer camp, most part of them, with an average of seven participants uh, per group. Uh, with an average of 40 to 8 hours a day during 3 to 5 uh, days a week. So pretty intensive for those that offer this program. Uh, and then use a mix of uh, constraint of CIMT and uh, bimanual uh, therapy. And most are offered once or twice a year maximum. So interesting, uh, we see that so the majority of rehab centers across Canada do not have the either CIMT or habit programs yet. So, uh, but the majority, so if you see that those who have group interventions or individual interventions, and some of them are overlapping, have mixed um, uh, groups, a mix of individual and group interventions, but only three of those that uh, do not offer the program have never tried it at all. So the person responding would say, well, we've tried once, it didn't work, or we, we've tried, we talked about it, but it didn't really, was not implemented. So only three of them have never really tried. And uh, six of those uh, that actually have it, uh, out of the group interventions, uh, all of them had a rehabilitation research on the side. And, okay. Uh, the programs were on uh, their majority offered or coordinated or supported or had the presence of uh, OTs, but also of PTs and other professionals, uh, all the way from social workers and uh, special educators and, and other professionals. Uh, they were, and the majority, they were intensive programs. One third of them were intensive programs, so intensive being more than four hours a day for more than three days a week for more than five weeks. Um, and so six out of nine used both, uh, both uh, CIMT and HABIT, as I mentioned before. So the activities that were offered, they go a lot with, along with the examples that were mentioned here already. So on uh, using both gross and uh, fine motor activities such as craft, circus, magic, all sort of different activities. And using uh, a variety of different uh, assessments, pre, post, and different formats. We are also very interested in the knowledge uptake, so in addressing what are the barriers, why, uh, what is happening, what is facilitating, or what is uh, hiring uh, the centers when offering these programs. And uh, some facilitators that came up as people responded to these questions were uh, being offered the opportunity to have continuing education, funding to implement the programs, having media coverage, which prompt parents to bring on the idea, well, this is important and want that for my child. Um, committed staff has been a very important uh, item, so people who are champions and who want to, to, to promote this type of programs. Family pressure, and nonetheless, you know, families who come and say, you really, uh, I think Darcy mentioned that as well. Uh, we want this program, you need to offer that to, for us. Um, also programs who are um, offered in conjunction with segregated school settings, so special schools who work together, rehab centers, um, uh, said that this is, was facilitating them to have uh, the ability to offer the programs, having connection with researchers to access uh, evidence-based information, and also access to literature in general. Barriers that were especially highlighted by uh, the people responding or again, you know, the, it's the other side of the coin, funding or lack of funding thereof. Uh, the service structure, so not having the uh, adequate staff or the program organization in their center to offer that type of uh, service. And also not having buy-in or family support and uh, not having a critical mass. So that, that was reported by smaller centers at the time. Not, we don't have enough people, enough kids to put together to create a group intervention. Interesting, um, so as I said, 92% of the centers that did not have the program had heard of it. So it's not, it's, the news is out there, so that was a, an interesting information. Uh, but half of the participants, and both who offered or you know sometimes offered once every two years, as is the case here, or 
different formats, but half of them didn't know where to refer kids who were interested in centers in their province, for that matter. Um, so, but from the people responding, which were, uh, like there were many, as we mentioned, many OTs, uh, PTs, but a lot of program managers, for instance, the majority of them were not involving in implementing or a developing program. So there were really, the information may be lost in the middle of between the clinicians and the, the reality of the program managers. So I just thought it was just this fun. <laughs> so that's just to say that, you know, we, we, we do have the information, but we do have many people still going for uninformed opinions, and uh, we're aiming at a different uh, change in this reality because we do happen to have a very good uh, scope of information on this uh, specific topic. <laughs> So that's why we wanted to make sure that we could shed some light in this data and have the understanding through the focus groups to really talk and, uh, and, and foster this discussion on, okay, what are the barriers and how can we address those? Um, so from our qualitative uh, uh, focus groups, and many of you have participated, which is good, so you can verify if the information is accurate. Uh, so we knew that one issue was about the source of knowledge. So what, what is about the knowledge in general? Evidence-based knowledge or having access to information is a barrier. So the source, where is the information coming from? Is it from, you know, um, scientific journals? Is it something that is highly accessible or easily accessible for clinicians and for people who are in the real world of new practice? The extent of the uh, knowledge that is available and specifically for, you know, constraint programs or for SAMPI, for habit, for intensive upper extremity training, there's a lot of information, but there's a limit to what's known for, uh, for the clinicians. Then the challenges in accessing knowledge, you know, all the way from having access to the databases that have the, 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 the scientific journals or having access to the information, having access to going to conferences or attending to, to, to reach for the information that we need. And also questioning what's the benefit or value of actually having this information for my reality, for my practice. Um, then on the knowledge uptake, so that's one thing, accessing knowledge, the other thing is putting into practice. Uh, and then a lot of had to do with, on the barriers had to do with environmental context. So, a context that facilitates, uh, that has, you know, people have access to research, that people are allowed to innovate and to try things new, so that was important. Uh, funding, as we mentioned before, also, also showed up in the interviews, it's a, it's a major issue, especially giving, you know, the attention, the one-to-one -one ratios, how to reorganize, rearrange the programs, the, the staff to, to meet the criteria that are needed to offer this type of program. The population being serviced, so not all centers, a lot of centers have only a few kids with CP, for instance, but they do have other populations. And then there's a question, is this evidence applied, as uh, we discussed before? Can we use this with a different population or a mixed group? So that was a question that uh, came up in the focus groups. And uh, the idea that success generates success. So if you tried one year and that was really good, you might as well try again next year and you, and you have the response from parents, you have the response from therapists, you have a proof to give to your program manager to say, see, that was good, we can offer this again. So, um, and the idea of a pay it forward, that was interesting, that came up as a theme that uh, clinicians who had the, the chance to go to a training session or to a conference, they had the idea that, okay, we need to pass this information for other families. On the other hand, families also who had had this therapy in different settings would say, well, we need to offer this again. We need to have access, to give access to this to other families as well. On uh, barriers and facilitators in general to create a program, so that's on, on knowledge uptake, but then also there is a need for uh, parent motivation. So buy-in from parents is a huge factor to make sure that parents understand the need and that they cope and they, and they collaborate with the program development and different stakeholders engagement. So as we said, all the way from funders to program managers to all the therapies that have to reorganize and work on summer and work on extra hours. So that's, uh, those are things that are needed in terms of creating a program. And then once you have it, there's always the challenge of uh, maintaining that program. So again, to, to make sure that you have commitment throughout the, the every time that the program is offered, that the organization of uh, the service organization is maintained in a way that you know we offered this year, you can offer next year again. When can you and how can you sustain those ideas and those programs? And uh, the community pressure to continue. So once you offer, you can just not remove something that looks really good. 
and uh, and the, the main outcome that has been reported over and over in our focus groups is to see you know happy families and kids seeing results of something that really works, which was uh, Andrew Gordon's the first line it works. <laughs> so that's a uh, that's a big result that um, was expressed in the focus groups. So within our next steps, we were on from learning or for, for people who have learned to then lead those groups and initiatives. So that's what we're doing today and we expect to accomplish both with you and through the webinar so that each one of you can take these messages and, and move it forward in the in leading the process. So we're happy to that this was scheduled and done. <laughs> uh, and next step we also discuss uh, some uh, best practices recommendations. So to see not only how we can break those barriers, but how we can go through them and make it happen into you know, across Canada where it's not happening yet. Um, okay, so um, we'd really like to acknowledge all the clinicians, many of you who have participated in, in, the, in the focus groups, uh, also across Canada, those on webinar, who have answered to the interviews and questions. Uh, we know the time is precious and uh, that's uh, really good that we could have this uh, picture from all of you. Uh, Joey, who uh, is our music coordinator and have worked really hard <laughs> on this project. Uh, Natalie, uh, who has really been great in supporting us in this uh, workshop and through all the project as well. So very, uh, it's a good example of a program manager who buys in and, and gets stuff done, so this is really good. And then Doug for uh, supporting extra besides being on a collaborating study, but putting this webinar together. So this is it for our part. Um, we'll open for questions if you have questions related for the study and perhaps I'll call Doug and to if we have questions for the other presenters as well that were on webinar and if you have uh, that as well we'll make questions for five minutes perhaps and then we'll have a short break and most important part of this <laughs> is that we really wanted to make sure that the knowledge translation piece which was the purpose of this workshop today gets done. For that, we'll have this discussion groups on how can we achieve those things, how can we make this happen within all of you. So we will ask you after the questions to uh, take a quick break and we'll break out in groups um, yeah, before lunch. <laughs> okay, so don't call. <laughs> and uh, so questions now. Yeah. Doug, do you want to? Okay. Any questions? So the question is if this approach applies to the adult population in a group approach. I, th I think, the, correct me if I'm wrong, Andy, but I think the initial literature was in the adult stroke population. Yes. And it, it's only then applied to the pediatrics. So the first literature that came out was on adults with stroke and then also animal models to show the under understanding the mechanisms um, to some extent, but um, the work began with adults and then was then applied and customized to children. I'm not sure which group, but definitely adult responses and strength post. Right. Uh, yeah, I don't know that they used a group approach, but they used this treatment, intensive treatment. Yeah, I don't I don't believe it was I don't know if in practice that's the approach, but I think the literature, and I don't think, in, I don't think that's been the model. I think that's the way it was applied and customized to children, given the important benefit of the group in terms of motivation and peer competition and support and just you know making it more of a social thing, which adds to the motivation piece. Uh, Darcy has a comment. There is support for evidence, though, of effectiveness of these strengths. Um, if I could ask the two other speakers to, to the other speakers to come up, all the speakers, because there are some questions that are coming from the webinar group that are more general questions. So this one I think would be uh, related to this last uh, presentation. Uh, this one is asking. This is from Liz, and she's saying a speech language pathologist used the Hannon program, and she's saying this has been a very successful model for centers to integrate into practice. Uh, would you consider a similar model for CIMT? I, I'm a, a huge fan of the Hannon program because it empowers the caregivers and parents to really try to generalize language stimulation activities into the day-to-day -day environment. And so 
we always like to build generalization principles for any therapy that we do, which would include constraint and uh, habit type programs, um, empowering the caregiver to carry over in the environment. So again, at a practical level, we do have homework that we assign that the caregivers are trying to implement. So you could think of that being like a Hammond program. They have to carry over and uh, really become mediators of the program in their own environments. I don't know, Andy, if you have other. No, I'm actually not familiar with the Hammond program, but um, like I said earlier, that I think that these intensive approaches just provide windows of opportunity. I mean, you, you don't want them to think that, well, the rule is I use my hand in camp, but I can go home and, you know, go back to my, my typical compensation. So I think getting families involved, um, like I said, we use homework, um, so we engage the parents early on daily during the camp with the idea that not really that it's not, that's not going to add intensity so much to what we're doing during an intensive period, but it starts the um, engagement of the parent and the child with opportunities for feedback. From, from us. So they, they, we give them suggestions, they go home, they implement it, they write out logs, come back, tell us what's working, what's not working, and allows us to problem solve um, how, how to really adapt this in the home environment. And I think while that isn't necessarily going to you know, result in the, you know, the big improvements that you see in these camp environments, it is going to allow them to you know, take this and, and make it part of their daily life, which I think ultimately is what the, the goal is. Uh, uh, Kathleen is asking, is there any current research underway for children ages 8 months to 18 months for intensive models of treatment? Uh, yeah. yeah, so um, I'm Christina Leason in, in Sweden has um, started a, a baby project in collaboration with some Australians. Um, I'm also familiar with uh, DeLuca and Ramey in Virginia are doing a, a, a baby constraint uh, project as, as well. Um, the results thus far um, that, that I've seen, in, there have been some studies that have included children as low as one year or even eight months, and it's, there's been suggestions of, of efficacy. Um, the problem that, that I have with, with the approach is that um, it's one thing to do a gentle restraint program like Aunt Christina Leeson has done, but some people are casting babies, and we don't know anything about the safety. Um, we know know that the, the cortical spinal tract is um, its development is uh, not complete until around one year of age, and even um, basically you're going to get myelination for you know a long period after that. We know in animal models from the work of John Martin that the the actual completion of the terminations of the cort the, the cortical spinal track to the spinal cord is activity dependent. So that means that you need to use the hand. Um, so restraining it for two or even you know several hours a day, probably not a problem. Restraining it during um, basically a you know a three week, you know, a twenty four seven, you know, for a long period, um, John Martin has shown in the cat that, that can result in permanent impairments in the development of kitten hand function. We don't know if that's true in, in humans, but you know, I, I think we'd want to know that before we start casting kids. Question back. The model is very different to the way the government or subsidized therapies overall. So just to repeat the question, um, what this, these studies are showing is that the current model of treatment of, let's say, one an hour a week for several weeks um, versus an intensive approach, which seems to make a difference, should we be questioning the current models of how we, pra how we package service delivery in terms of rehabilitation for other treatments that go beyond this type of treatment. Um, so it sort of questions the way we are um, packaging our hours of service to children in terms of early interventions. So it, it's a very interesting question and, and I think in Canada you have a, a much better chance of making rapid changes than we do in, in the U.S. What I've always argued for, um, based upon the evidence of constraint therapies and, and so forth, is why not have um, third-party uh, payers uh, allocate a certain number of hours per year? 
and then let the therapists and physicians decide, do we want to spend those hours in the three-week period, or do we want to distribute those over a longer period, depending upon what the particular goals are. Um, and that would basically result in the cost being very similar, but, you know, basically going towards where at least some of the evidence is with the upper extremity. Um, I skipped over, uh, due to time, uh, the application of these intensive models to um, kids with bilateral uh, cerebral palsy, predominantly um, diplegia, uh, basically where we um, focused also on the, the lower um, extremity as, as well. We've now run 10 kids uh, between Brussels and New York, um, and we've had excellent results in uh, not only improving things like, you know, gate speed, but, you know, GMF, GMF them and uh, basically other uh, quantitative measurements of, of balance and, and so forth. So I think that, um, yeah, intensity can be applied to anything we do, including uh, speech. So I think um, one thing to consider, at least in the meantime, is the importance of modeling whatever it is you are doing in that 45 minutes periodically over a month uh, with, with, with the child as when you provide intervention, that there is a caregiver there who is spending time with the child and you are basically modeling what they should be doing during the day daily with the child so that your one hour of that child, which is so, you know, it's such a small amount of their life that it actually carries over into their daily life experience but in, a, in a meaningful context, which is their daily life at the home or in the community with the people that they spend their time with. So I think that's where we should really spend our energy is really showing the caregivers how to do whatever treatments we believe make a difference in a way that's meaningful and more intensive. Just to say, the part of what we would like to achieve with this meeting today is also to, like with the next part of the discussion, is exactly to brainstorm between people who have done it, who are doing, who are adapting realities and programs to see what's visible and how could we accomplish that. So that's part of what we would we really want to achieve with the meetings like that. So. All right, the next question we're going to take uh, from the webinar questions uh, is from Kathleen, and she's asking, are you aware of any current research that looks at causes of hemiplegia and the outcomes related to CIMT or habit? And she's suggesting causes such as perinatal stroke versus neuronal migration causes. Um, there's, there have not been systematic studies um, looking at the different causes. Um, you know, I know in our um, close to 200 Children. We document very carefully the, uh, the neurologies in, in, involved in, um, well, we haven't done a systematic uh, a comparison or, you know, model of prediction. We see improvements across all, all different types um, of, of causes. Uh, there has been a couple of small studies looking at how the, the brain uh, adapts to the, to the injury. Uh, for example, the, uh, in, in a proportion of the children, the cortical spinal track, um, basically the, the brain will reorganize so that um, you have ipsilateral organization instead of your typical contralateral organization. And the small study suggested that uh, basically children with the normal contralateral projections will have a better outcome with constraint therapy than, uh, than kids with, who have this reorganization to the ipsilateral side. Um, there have been a couple other studies that have not supported that. Our own work in by manual training has suggested that it, it doesn't matter what, the, what the, the reorganization is, that you'll get plasticity and that you'll get improvements. The difference is, is the uh, baseline function that you, you might be starting with. The kids with ipsilateral reorganization typically are more uh, severely affected, but they improve just, just as much as the, as the others. Um, but yes, these are all important things to look at. If you're going to spend all this time and money and, um, you know, in, into you know, basically providing these treatments, you do want to know, as Darcy mentioned, who are the kids most likely to, to respond. And um, so far, it's, you know, most children are responding. Oh, can I, I'm just going yeah, to... Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're actually in the middle of a research project looking at that very question, trying to look at what the underlying neurologic injury is and does that predict response to constraint. And uh, we hypothesize that the individuals with more typical middle cerebral artery infarcts would respond better than the... Uh, children who have the periventricular, sort of the one associated with prematurity, and uh, we're finding that 
both types of injury uh, the children are responding. And so uh, the other really interesting thing in this particular aspect of the study is that we're seeing a trend of more of our children with a diagnosis of hemiplegic CP having this periventricular uh, injury. So uh, I'm sure you're probably also seeing that in, in your practice. So just uh, make you aware of that. And we'll probably find that in the CP registry when we dig into that data too. All right, thank you for, to everyone out there that's been paying attention or has been listening on the uh, webinar. Uh, this is going to conclude the webinar portion of the presentation because we are breaking up into group discussion. Uh, the presentation, the recording, the audiovisual, and, and any of the PowerPoints that we're able to share, there will be some things that we may not be able to share, just uh, the video clips and some of the images perhaps. I'll have to confirm that with some of the speakers, but we'll make whatever we can make available on the Capsi Knowledge Exchange Network, and you'll receive an email uh, notifying you when that's all available. So thank you again for, uh, for watching this. And we will, uh, there were some questions we could not answer, so what we're going to make uh, our, we're going to try our best to pull those questions that were not answered and between the different presenters put some bullet points down of what we feel the answers are and we'll do this offline through email and distribute that in the next week or so. So thanks so much for your participation, we really appreciate it.